Welcome, everybody. This is Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development for our Educators podcast. I'm delighted to have with me Dr. Jeff Standridge, who is a best selling author and innovation coach. He's the MD of Innovation Junkie, uh, who exists to empower innovators and entrepreneurs. Dr. Jeff, great to have you with us. It is great to be here. Thank you so much. Look, we're delighted to have your time. You are a unique person doing incredible things. And so why don't you just tell us what you're doing now and how you came to get there. That's going to be an interesting story. Sure. So I really split my time in three different capacities, quite frankly. Uh, One is I teach at the University of Central Arkansas. I teach entrepreneurial finance and innovation leadership. Uh, The second being a course that I created for graduate students, both at the MBA and PhD levels. Uh, And so that's obviously a part-time gig as an adjunct professor, but uh, I serve as the managing director of of two organizations, uh, one called the Conductor and Innovation Junkie and the other uh, Cadron Capital Partners. So I'm involved in uh, an organization, it's a public-private partnership, and we focus on inspiring and empowering entrepreneurs, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, inventors, creators, and what have you. And, uh, and then occasionally we come across companies or, or entrepreneurs that we want to invest in. So we have a fund that we will invest in those companies to help them fuel their growth. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a very rural state in, in North America in the United States called Arkansas, uh, only 3 million people. And, uh, you know, we, uh, are always looking to grow economically as a state. And so really where I spend my time is trying to help create jobs effectively. And I believe you had a president come from Arkansas. Would that be correct? We sure did. We sure did. Uh, president Bill Clinton. Uh, he, was, he was from a, a, a place called Hope, literally a, a small town in southwest Arkansas, probably, oh, about 75 miles from my hometown uh, uh, before he ended up uh, going off to the University of Arkansas and ultimately getting his law degree and becoming governor and then eventually president. Well, great things come from Arkansas then, yeah? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Great thing. So uh, with Innovation Junkie and what you're doing there, I saw also on LinkedIn that you provided a Monday morning tip about looking at your time and how people use their time over the year, the 2,080 hours that we have and delegating, automating, um, using your time really well. What inspired you to do that Monday morning post? You know, so I, I speak with a lot of entrepreneurs and, and innovators, and they talk about how there's just not enough time in the day to get things done, or they, they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how they can replicate themselves. And so, you know, having worked for a publicly traded company on salary for a period of time, I happen to know that 2,080 hours is what's considered a full-time work year. And so I just round that down to 2,000 and say, look, spend some time taking uh, taking uh, account of where you're spending your time. And uh, first of all, however, take a look at the annual revenue requirements of your company or what your annual income goal is and divide that by 2,080 uh, to make it easy by 2,000. And that'll give you an idea of what your time is worth. And then track your time and see where you're spending your time. And if you're spending your time uh, on tasks that are considerably uh, less valuable tasks than, than whatever your hourly wage is worth, then you really need to be looking to bring somebody on board to help take care of those tasks so that you can work on the higher value activities. And so that's a technique that we've used to help entrepreneurs uh, figure out where they need to bring in resources to help them actually scale their companies beyond their current state today. And so knowing that uh, COVID-19 uh, was, was hitting here in North America at the time and um, you know, we had a number of, of business owners and entrepreneurs who were really struggling to figure out where they needed to be spending their time and how they needed to, to, uh, to hunker down, if you will, to keep their, their companies afloat. Uh, I was, in, uh, you know, uh, inspired, if you will, to, to, to put that, that post out there uh, so that folks could, could look at, what, you know, how they needed to, to augment their own capabilities in, in order to grow their companies and keep their companies afloat. I think it's really interesting when people treat their time like a resource, which is a finite resource. It's not unlimited. We have a certain number of hours in the day. As an educator, how would someone who has to plan and then teach and then assess and then do meetings, those four kind of four, four core parts of a day-to-day practice of a teacher, 
what are some strategies as well that they could implement to look at the best use of their time? Because many of the people enrolled in our Masters in Education program are either principals already, their directors, their heads of department, or their aspiring leaders. So what are some other strategies they could use to position themselves for greater success? You know, I like to think about uh, thinking of what your best and highest use is, what's your best and highest contribution to whatever endeavor that you're engaged in. Uh, you know, there are certain things that I'm just not really good at. And because I'm not really good at them, it takes an inordinate amount of time uh, in order to do those things at a level of acceptable quality. Whereas I could hire someone uh, who can do those things much more naturally than I at a higher level of quality, and they can do them in half the time. And I think it's in, in, particularly in education where, where budgets are somewhat constrained it's difficult to think in that, in that capacity or in, to think in that manner. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, when we think about what our best and highest use is uh, in terms of whether it's educating, running a business, or, or even running a family for that matter, uh, and we focus on spending the vast majority of our time at that best and highest use, that's when we really see the tangible results. And, and so uh, that's just kind of a, an overall work philosophy that I would encourage people to adopt. Mm. Challenging for educators with limited salaries all around the world right. and demands being face to face with people is is an educator's passion when you're with mm -hmm. students and with other mm -hmm. teachers as well and trying to do professional development if that's their gig as well. Mm -hmm. And so outside of that, there are certain things that people need to do to be prepared and then marking and grading and things like that. Can you think of some other perspectives as well that a teacher could bring to their time to uh, improve maybe their effectiveness? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't grade uh, traditionally. Uh, I bring the business aspect into my classroom. And I started doing this about 25 years ago when I was teaching in a, uh, in a, uh, a healthcare curriculum. Uh, I grade on a learning contract. So I established the base level requirements for the grade of an A, a B, or a C. And the first week of class, actually the first couple of weeks of class, uh, students take those base level requirements and they renegotiate those with me in order to make learning more specific to their ultimate end objectives. And so ultimately, by the time the second week of a semester gets started, every student has an individually negotiated learning contract with me for the grade of whatever it is that they want to receive, whether it's an A or a B or a C, which is the grading scale that we use most prolifically here in the U.S., uh, hopefully no one would contract for a grade lower than that. Uh, um, and so far I haven't had anybody do that, but, but here's the other thing. They don't, if they don't fulfill the terms of the grade for which they've negotiated, they don't get the next lower grade. They receive a failing grade because they didn't do what they said they were going to do wow. uh, when, when they said they were going to do it. And, and, it, and it's an attempt to bring real life into the workforce, right? Or into the teaching force, rather into the college classroom. And so this really takes the onus off of the instructor to be the center around which education revolves and puts the center back on the student. And so I get up every day and I think about how to help those students fulfill the terms of their learning contract. Now, they can renegotiate with me at any time if they feel that they are at risk of breaching their contract or they perhaps have let things go and they've procrastinated and now they're coming toward the end of a term and they have another class where they have a big test that's looming they may need to negotiate downward from the grade of an A to the grade of a B in my class. And that's okay. That's, that's called real life. It's called prioritizing. And so, uh, you know, in doing that, not only do I shift the, the focus of education back to the student, quite frankly, the student has to bear much of the responsibility. So I spend a lot less of my time fulfilling the administrative tasks of marking papers and spend more of my time coaching consulting, uh, uh, advising students and, and helping them uh, achieve, their, achieve their learning objectives. Yeah, I love that, shifting people back into their subject matter expert status rather than being an administrator. Yeah. I really That's like right. that. That's Thank right. you for that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Hey, why don't you share with us um, one of the interesting experiences you've had working with companies or an entrepreneur with Innovation Junkie? You know, uh, we're involved actually right now in a in launching a large innovation project with a one of the top 10 children's hospitals in the in the united states and so we're just getting off the ground and i'm really excited to see what that's going to bring uh 
but you know, one of the things that, that um, uh, we have been able to do is to help companies. Uh, we run an accelerator program called the 10X Growth Accelerator. So we bring companies in uh, that have to have a minimum amount of annual revenue. And we take them through a 14 week learning curriculum and a coaching curriculum. And we've had companies that have in the, in a period of 24 to 36 months from starting the program have literally uh, increased the, the, the revenue of their company by 1000% by 10 X. Wow. Uh, they've increased the number of employees. They've increased the number of, of uh, uh, clients that are using their services. And, you know, we, we during COVID, we saw a company that, uh, they were a, a farm to table uh, uh, farm operation. So they were organic farming. They raised uh, chickens, uh, uh, beef cattle, and, uh, and, and, and produced pork or pigs. And much of their uh, revenue would come in from shipping uh, in the 48 states, and the, the, the upper 48 states, lower 48 states of the United States, rather. And, uh, but most of their, their, uh, their shipping orders would come in in a very analog fashion on the telephone or, or uh, uh, what have you. And so we helped them put in a, um, an e-commerce capability and, and, and uh, 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 an online ordering system. And, and so what's interesting is that in the other streams of revenue, once COVID hit, once the COVID-19 economic crisis hit, they were down anywhere from 50 to 100% in the other lines of revenue. But because they had done the work uh, to build out their their e-commerce platform, they were up over a thousand percent in their direct consumer via e-commerce. And so, you know, while while many companies were really struggling to even keep their doors open during the early days of the COVID nineteen economic crisis, this company was actually thriving because the most profitable component of their business was actually growing by 10, 10 x or a thousand percent. Amazing! That's an incredible impact so, in the short period very, of time. It's very encouraging to see an entrepreneur walk into your office with a, uh, a bit of a downtrodden look. They feel a bit beaten down, if you will, um, but then to, to work them through a process to help them walk out with a kick in their step, a twinkle in their eye, and a plan to do something positive. Love it. Why don't you share with us about your doctorate that you did, uh, your focus on innovation leadership? Yes. Love to hear about that. Sure. So, uh, so I was a, a professor at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences. I was teaching in a respiratory therapy curriculum. So I taught uh, cardiopulmonary anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, neonatal and pediatric intensive care. But I noticed that our students were graduating and they were becoming shift supervisors, uh, hospital administrators, and, and, and what have you very, very quickly. As I mentioned earlier, we're in a very rural state, but they had no leadership training. And so I created a course in leadership for these students so that when they did graduate and, and moved into those advanced level positions, they at least had a foundation. And I absolutely fell in love with the world of leadership and organizational design and organizational change management. So I decided to pursue a doctorate in, uh, in education with an emphasis in just that, leadership and organizational development. And I was studying the differences, my, my dissertation research was studying the differences between top 1% of performers and middle 50% of performers. Uh, what is it that differentiates them? It's not academic credentials. It's not certifications. It's not anything that can really be tested. It's something that's really observable and uh, was quantifying those differences into models that could be assessed, evaluated, coached, trained, and a publicly traded company in the uh, data analytics space came to me, a billion dollar corporation came to me and said, we want to do that exact same research with our IT professionals. Would you come to work for us? And so uh, that led to a series of, of innovations in my own career, if you will, or evolutions that took me effectively out of a healthcare career into a global uh, executive role where I worked in multiple countries, started companies in Poland and China, acquired companies in the Middle East and Brazil, uh, and so uh, ultimately led me into the world of entrepreneurship. And so it was, people say that really seems like it was a revolution, uh, a revolutionary career path. And I say, well, it, it may seem revolutionary, but from my perspective, it was really evolutionary, if you will. I'd love for educators to just understand that they gain skills and opportunities all along the way and that oh, their absolutely. skills that they receive, they can take them anywhere in the world. 
You know, that's a great point. So I, I shared with you earlier, for the 20 years that I was in that publicly traded company, 99% of the people that I interacted with in 21 countries never even knew I had a doctor of education. And quite frankly, they didn't care. They wanted to see that I produced. Um, but I will tell you, I would not have been equipped to take that role, nor would I have been equipped to excel in that role like I did over the next 20 years without the key learnings that I developed through uh, a doctorate of education. I mean, it was a, it was a phenomenal learning experience. I never will forget the, the, the evening that I, that I graduated and walked across the stage and got my diploma and, uh, and was walking uh, across the parking lot to the car, I'd spent two nights a week for five years working on that degree. Uh, I had two small children. I had a wife. And I, I told my wife as I was walking across the parking lot with my, my cap and diploma in one hand and my, my robe draped over my shoulder, I said, you know, there's a really cool MBA program, master of business program. And she said, absolutely <laughs> not. No, 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 no. Yeah. So the, just the process of learning is something that really inspires me. Dr. Jeff, I really want to thank you for your time. I can see it's becoming nighttime already. Thank you so much. Uh, with the video cast, we're going to put links to your LinkedIn, uh, to your website as well. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been my pleasure and I appreciate you for, for having me.